Now, back in the book of Exodus, we're not going to turn there because I think we know the account well enough, but back in the book of Exodus, remember that Moses, the Lord's true minister, along with Aaron, who was a true minister part of the time and a false one part of the time, but who made it in because Moses prayed for him. And Moses tells us that God was so angry with Aaron to destroy him, but I interceded and God spared his life and let him keep on living to a ripe old age. We have the magicians of Pharaoh who were steeped in the occult and sorcery and who therefore were controlled by Satan to do these various wonders. Now I think when we've covered that before, some of those wonders, let's say the snake business, uh, I don't know exactly what happened then. I don't think the Bible tells us exactly what happened because if one thing that was, it was a wonder. How could the other magicians throw down their rod and their rods turn into snakes as well? Or how could they turn, turn the Nile River, the water in it, into blood? Or at least pools of it somewhere around, something that hadn't been touched by Moses and his curse already. How could they do something like that? It's generally acknowledged that although these miracles are certainly supernatural, there most definitely is a limit to what Satan can and can't do. He can't create life. Only God can create. But he can deceive. I think we've talked some before about these, about the serpents back in Old Testament introduction, so I don't want to get back into that too much. But I'll confess, I don't know exactly what happened. I wasn't there. You always have to be real hesitant saying, I'm an authority when that happened thousands of years ago. The only way you can be an authority is you've got to be able to stand on a report of someone who was there like Moses, who wrote the account there in the book of Exodus. So I don't know what took place, but I know it's a sign and a lying wonder. But do remember this. Let's forget about the snake example so far. Let's go to the turning of the Nile River into blood, or at least a red appearance to it or whatever. Remember, dear friends, that the world of the spirits pervades this world and not this world, that world. That's right. And right. so it is so easy. It's like, it's like one box being contained in another box, and the box on the inside is ours. Now, how are you going to ever get out of that to get into the next world, but that world contains our world all inside of it? So that realm, you see, pervades this realm and not this realm, that realm. So to me, it seems like it would be a small thing for Satan or some demon simply to manipulate the so-called laws of nature. Levitate a table? Why can't he just get right under it, an invisible spirit, and pick the thing up? Mm -hmm. yeah. That seems right. to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Healing someone, someone who has a broken bone, why can't a demon get in there and get the bones put back together? I think he could do that. I don't see why not. Now, create life. Now, no, a demon or the devil can't do that but the manipulation of the so-called laws of nature that a lot of people worship as though they were God's spiritual laws or something. Those are just natural laws. Certainly they've been established by God, and they're true most of the time. If you step off of a 10-story building, you're going to go down, not up, most of the time. But there are times that if you were on top of the building and you stepped off and it was time for the rapture, you wouldn't go down but up. So there'd be a time it'd be overcome. So it's not some spiritual law that's going to exist forever and ever that somehow you, people think those are holy laws, the laws of nature. And, they, and because they think that, they assume, well, there's no way God would ever let the devil interfere with that. Well, I don't see why not. How else is he going to perform a sign and a lying wonder Amen. Yeah, that's right. besides getting in there and manipulating things that we can't see with our eyes? He can get in there as an invisible force and manipulate these things. Jesus said that it would happen in Matthew 24 and verse 24. He uses the same two words. And by the way, these same words are used for the miracles done by the Lord himself, signs and wonders. They're used over in Hebrews, uh, what, 2-4, for example. But in Matthew 24 and verse 24, there shall arise false Christs, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Now this proves that we can be using 2 Thessalonians 2.9 like we are, that even though 2 Thessalonians 2.9 speaks explicitly of Antichrist, and he hasn't been revealed yet. 
and the signs and wonders he's going to do, didn't I tell you there'd be some forewarning of that? Well, here it is right here in Matthew 24, 24. There are going to be other people, not, an, not the Antichrist, but Antichrist, small a and plural, who come before him, who do smaller things, but the same types of things that he's going to do, great signs and wonders. And deceive, if it were possible, the very elect which means it's not possible, so let's don't bog down with that. You cannot deceive the very elect. That's right. There's no way. That's why I'm not afraid about anything. There's no way. You're guaranteed of that. It's something that's certain that if you're part of the elect, you'll never be deceived, and you'll prove whether you're elect or not, whether you get deceived or not. So there's nothing you can do about it one way or the other. But we're going to keep our eyes on the Word of God because the Word of God teaches that God's going to use means to keep us from being deceived, and one of those methods is the knowledge of the Bible. Amen. So you can't just sit down and say, well, I don't have to worry about anything. I'll never even open the Bible. I can never be deceived. No, because that's false teaching right there, because he's going to use means to keep you away from deception, and one of those happens to be the knowledge of the Word of God. Amen. So that's why we're studying the Word of God. But I've got this assurance. And so you can't put fear over people and say, well, it might happen to you anyway. No, it won't. It's impossible. Jesus said it's impossible, so you just contradicted him. If you said, well, if you don't watch out, it may happen to you anyway. No, if you're an elect individual, it'll never happen to you no matter what. And if you're elect, you will be in the Word of God, like, like I am. So I know I'm elect, and so you have to know yourself whether you're elect. Amen. I hope that you are, but I know that I am. But what if you're not? Well, time will tell, won't it? That's right. In so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So we'll give you our paraphrase. It will be possible they'll deceive everyone but the very elect. Amen. That's right. I think that's what he's saying here. Amen. That's right. <laughs> it's possible. It's going to happen. Mark it down. It's already happening. Amen. How many of your charismatic friends have been deceived by some love minister out there? Amen. Or some money minister out Amen. there? Right. Many of them have been deceived by people like that. Amen. They're not elect, is what that proves. That have been caught up in this and have fallen away for these things. They're not elect. And we haven't seen that much yet. Great signs, great signs. The adjective is great, not just little healings, but great signs and wonders. Signs that point toward, it looks like, divine authority confirming the so-called prophet's ministry. It wasn't long ago, dear friends, where I just still, I just, Lord, what's going on out there? Amen. And you just lump all of them together and just say they're all wrong. They're all wrong. It's better to say that just that they're all wrong than say, well, there might be four that aren't because the devil will bring those four along. <laughs> and you'll see those and then you'll start thinking, well, there must be four more. And the next four won't be the four that aren't. There'll be four that aren't. In so much that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Now, that's just not found only there, but go back to Deuteronomy. We'll find it again. Miracles aren't just something, friends, for charismatics to work. So-called suspension of laws of nature aren't just something for God to work through charismatics today. And it's not just something that's happening 20th century or church age, but Deuteronomy 13 and uh, verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee, and here's the same two words, a sign or a wonder. The same two words. And he is a prophet and he is a dreamer of dreams. And many people today are having dreams and visions. And the sign or the wonder come to pass whether it's making the axe head float again, the devil can do that just like God. Just send a demon scuba diving and bring it back up. We've got to remember that we live in this carnal physical world. We're so limited in this world. And we don't know unless you start thinking all the ins and outs. How easy would it be? Demons don't drown. <laughs> remember they went off the cliff and the hogs, they didn't drown. How easy would it be just to go under the water? It's not underwater to them, it's just to us because they don't have water. They don't drink a cup of water when they get thirsty. But to us, go underwater, get the axe head, bring it up and hold it 
right at the surface of the water, and you never see a demon standing on the bottom of the creek holding that axe head up. You say, oh, miracle. If so, you know, come on and be honest. If one of your charismatic friends saw that, they'd say, God, that is the great power of God. Amen. But it could be a sign and a lying wonder. What would you or I say about that? Does it prove anything at all? Just because you saw an axe head float. Who did it? If Elisha did it, well, then it's the great power of God that did it. But if it's Hananiah and not Jeremiah, well, we're talking about a different group of people, different group of children, children of this world, children of the devil, not children of God. Because this next verse says, And the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee and gave you, of course, a false message, which is supposed to enlighten your eyes in a hurry to the fact that he's not the one to be following. So here they've got signs and wonders. Matthew 24, Jesus says there will be signs and wonders done. Antichrist is going to be doing signs and wonders. Revelation 13 mentions some of the signs and wonders that are going to be done. Talks about great signs and wonders over there. And yet our text still is 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, that the apostasy and the revelation of the man of sin come in the self-same verse which gives me the inclination that charismania is going to be a stage of preparation for the world of the revelation of Antichrist. You see, signs and wonders have been done before, but I wonder if as many as we see today, have been done before, where everyone is just doing everything out there today. Without all of this in the charismatic movement, where divine healing, where these various miracles, those are just common terms, common words, even among secular people out there, is that not a good preparation for them so that when Antichrist comes on the scene and he works a lying sign or wonder, they won't say, well, what's a miracle? The world's going to know about miracles and signs and lying wonders because charismatics are doing them in preparation for Antichrist. You see, something's got to pave the way and lead up to him. Or he comes on the scene and works a miracle and people say, what's a miracle? Well, people are going to know about miracles. They're going to know about these things. Because everyone's talking about them now. In this country and other parts of the world as well. Charismania, the charismatic movement, the apostasy, the falling away. Maybe just the bridesmaid to Antichrist who's soon going to come on the scene. Preparing the way for deception, getting the whole world already used to the miraculous. And how much easier prey then will not only the whole world be, but the charismatic movement itself, because she's been right in the midst of so many miracles for so long. Whether they're of God or not, it's beside the point. Still miracles. Some have been done by God, others that have been done by Satan. I mean, why are they here in the same verse? Falling away, have you, are you totally convinced that we're talking about, and that he's talking about charismatics here? Matthew 7, we looked at all of that. And he's talking about falling away from something, and he tells us over in 1 Timothy 4 what it is, falling away from the Christian faith, the only type of Christian faith during Paul's days, charismatic faith. He couldn't think, oh, I'm talking about Episcopalian faith. They're going to fall. No, he's not talking about that. I'm talking about World Council of Churches. No, he's not talking about that. There was no World Council of Churches. There was no world. They just lived in Italy and Greece then. Christianity wasn't all over the world. He's not talking about World Council of Churches. He's talking about Christendom as it existed then, and it's closely coming to that today as charismatic Christendom today. Because as soon as you get the Holy Spirit, let's put that in quotation marks, inside Roman Catholicism, you've got it in Christendom then. Because Roman Catholicism is Christendom. Southern Baptist Convention, what, 14 million people? Roman Catholics, over a half a billion people? Doesn't even compare. When you get the so-called Holy Spirit, the charismatic movement, let me say that, in Roman Catholicism, you've got it in Christendom then. You don't even have to get it in the Protestant church. 
Just get it in Roman Catholicism and you've got it in Christendom because there is the major force in the world for Christendom today. Half a billion people, if not more. I've heard estimates of as high as 800 million people are nominal Roman Catholics. Because you know what that means. If you live in Argentina, you're a Catholic. As soon as you're born, you're a Catholic. There are just some countries that the whole country is Catholic. So all you got to do is find out what's the population of this country. There's Catholicism in this country. It's not like we Protestants, we count Baptists, Episcopalians. No, you just count all the Catholics. <coughs> and who's made the biggest deal? We're trying to lead up to all these things about the charismatic movement. The Roman Catholic Church. Amen. And a pope who put his so-called blessing on the charismatic movement. What's he doing that for? Unless that's just part of the end time plan. And I don't know if you're keeping up with your readings like, like I have been the last few years. But have you noticed how so many of the Protestants now are saying, let's join the Catholics because we all have the Holy Spirit? I find that to be remarkable. There was a day not long ago a Protestant would spit on the ground that a Catholic walked on. And not when you get this spirit of love and unity, though. Everyone joins together. There is a Pentecostal leader who I think is pushing 80 now. Pentecostal leader. He's been known all over the world for, what, half a century now. I used to listen to his tapes back when I first got the baptism. I heard him because he was known as Mr. Pentecost. He's also known as the Pentecostal Pope as well because he's had audiences at the Vatican and he's not Catholic and they put his ble their blessings on him and he's helping to unite all Protestants who are filled with the Spirit and Catholics as well and doing a good job of it at that. Amen. And what about these big charismatic conferences here in this country? The vast majority of the participants have been Roman Catholic Charismatics. Amen with a sprinkling of Protestants in their midst as well. So in case you're thinking, well, I thought according to Revelation 17, somehow Catholicism was going to have some play, some part to play in the latter-day apostasy. Well, that's what I'm telling you, it is going to. But not just Roman Catholicism, but charismatic Roman Catholicism, as she incorporates Protestant Pentecostalism and that element of the charismatic movement into her midst, which is exactly what she's doing today. They're joined, and the Protestants don't want it any other way. They want to join hands together. They think these Catholics aren't so bad after all. And the Protestants know how bad, or the Catholics know how bad the Protestants are, but now they've got the baptism, we've got to all join together. And what about these so-called outpourings of the Spirit on these various groups of Roman Catholics? I'll tell you what, and the people that the Spirit was poured out upon back in, what, 67, are still in the Roman Catholic Church today with all of her first-degree heresies. Amen. Now, can you make it into the kingdom believing another gospel? No way. Paul said, if you preach another gospel, then let that man be accursed. What did Paul preach? Paul preached this gospel. If any man say that an individual can be saved by works rather than faith, let him be accursed. And what does the Roman Catholic Church say? If any man say that an individual is to be saved by works and not by faith, let him be accursed. I call that another gospel. I call that a reversal of the roles. Amen. A reversal of the clear teaching of the Word of God. But that's exactly what came out of Tridentine doctrine in the middle of the 16th century is if a man says that you're to be justified by faith and not by works, then let that man be accursed. That's another gospel because Paul said the only way you can be justified is by faith and not by works. So these people, I'm saying, who are in Roman Catholicism who so-called have the baptism of the Holy Spirit can they be converted? Can they really be saved? Can they really make it into the kingdom? Not according to Paul's teaching that if you preach another gospel, if it's an angel from heaven, then let that man be accursed. And the, the one emphasis of Catholicism is a man is justified by faith with works, 
And the one emphasis of Paul's teaching is a man is justified by faith without works. <laughs> With and without. That, that means you're on opposite ends of the spectrum then. Those are opposite words, with and without. Yeah. With faith and works together, or faith and no works at all. Well, you can have it whichever way you want, but you're only going to make it into the kingdom taking it God's way. Yeah. And his ways the man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So there's another gospel. So I'm saying that, yes, according to Revelation 17, Catholicism is going to have some part to play in the latter-day apostasy. But why think of the Vatican? Why not think of what the devil is working through today, the charismatic movement in Catholicism, not just Vatican. You don't have spirit-filled people for the most part in the Vatican, none that I know of. But you've got them everywhere else, though. And the baptism, and that's always in quotation marks if we're using it in a derogatory sense, has only slowly worked its way up hierarchy lines and maybe get maybe one archbishop over here filled with the Spirit. But how many untold priests and nuns can talk in tongues, though? Amen. And they're really the ones out there who control the people, you see. They say they're tied to the Vatican, but you know as well as I do, a lot of them are rebels, and they do what they want to do. Amen. They just believe a lot of things that aren't Vatican doctrine. But they're priests and nuns. I mean, the Pope's not the one that controls the people. It's the person's priest that controls the way they live and what they think. He's the one bringing messages to them all the time. He's the one controlling their life, not Vatican hierarchy. And who has the baptism today? Quotation marks. The priest, the nun. Not the Pope, not the cardinals, not the Pope's secretaries back in the Vatican. But it's out there in the lay charismatic movement in Roman... Catholicism where we see the baptism in quotation marks exists and maybe this is part of this falling away so I'm not saying that here in verse 3 of chapter 2 that Antichrist is going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit so don't misquote me on that I'm just saying isn't it interesting the way we have things set up here and isn't it interesting that since the charismatic movement is known for its miracles and we know, secondly, that the charismatic movement is mentioned here in the falling away. We proved that in a message several weeks ago. Then what about the connection there between verse 3 and verse 9 and between the charismatic movement with all of its miracles, emphasis on that, and Antichrist with all of his emphasis on miracles and these power signs and lying wonders? Amen. That all of this, much of this at least, could be done by him by the power of Satan, the same source where he gets his power, that people don't even realize that today. They just keep on going and saying, look at this miracle, look at that, look at this individual, and they speak in tongues, and maybe they do, maybe they don't. These belly flops on the stage, just false stuff that's going on. That's not inspired of God. Slaying other people in the spirit. Or maybe you get slain in the spirit, no one pushes you over, but it still could be another spirit, though. That just caused you to lose your balance and fall over. Cause you to feel dizzy and fall over. Another spirit. Still with power, though. Still with signs. Still with wonders. But they're all lying because they're not from heaven. It's a supernatural work, all right, that's being done. But what I'm saying is, isn't the charismatic movement going to be used? I'm asking you the question, but I already know the answer. As a prelude to bringing in Antichrist, since there's this connection, very vital connection in the miraculous realm. Amen. And the world, I mean, if Antichrist came in the early 1800s, they'd say, miracles, divine healing, we've never heard of things like that. Amen. But today, everyone is going to know about miracles. Amen. And people are following miracles today. Even when they say they're not following miracles, you can't, you just can't turn your back on that minister as long as you know he's doing miracles because something just feels funny inside of you. Yeah. You think there's still miracles. I know he believes the JDS heresy. Because that's what some of you used to think at one time. I know he believes in JDS heresy, but I've got a problem, miracles. Well, they shouldn't be a problem after what we're looking at this evening. Amen. They ought to be there. They should be there. As lying miracles, as lying signs, as lying wonders. Verse um, 11, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 
Why? It's because they have not received the truth, verse 10, that's been taught. Amen. And various elements in the charismatic movement, I mean, as soon as you get in the charismatic movement, you know, you're supposed to know what truth is. If you're a Roman Catholic, one thing you come into is the power of the Holy Spirit who testifies to Jesus, not to Mary. Amen. You may not be in a church like this, but you are within a stone's throw of truth, and you could find it if you wanted to find it. If you would look hard enough, truth is all around you in the charismatic movement. The blood of Jesus, Psalm 91, the angels of God for protection, prosperity, healing, it's all there. Mm -hmm. If you look hard enough and throw away all the other junk, it's there if you'll look Amen. for it. But they don't receive that, though. That's right. They receive the little elements they want to and not with the full intent of the word of God. They've received not the love of the truth. They don't love the truth. They love the bless me packs, but they don't love the truth. That's what he says, for the love of the truth, verse 10. God's going to send them strong delusion. And notice what it said. It said that they received not the love of the truth, verse 10, that they might be saved. That proves they're not saved then. Even if they've got the Matthew 7 signs, they're still not saved. They're still not one of the elect to salvation. And remember, since we saw in Matthew 24, 24, that these same things, the lying signs and wonders, would be done by false Christ, false apostles, before Antichrist ever comes on the scene, then this verse 11 could apply to now as well as to when he comes. That this could be part, part of, I told you before, technically verse 11 applies to Antichrist, but if you're going to connect it with a Matthew 24, which is a passage on eschatology, then obviously you can see that this could, in a small measure, begin to apply now. That what we're seeing out there is a heaven-sent strong delusion. That the people will believe a lie. Because the truth is there, and they're getting worse, they really are. The charismatic leaders out there, <coughs> a lot of them are getting worse. They've always been bad. Don't misunderstand me. They've always been bad. But they're getting worse, though inventing all of these tricks and treats there didn't used to be so many tricks and treats because no one had been to school to advertising and now they have back in the old days you didn't have the deception that you have today and you do have it out there today and so what we've got these people believing a lie verse 12 that they all might be damned and i don't enjoy preaching a message like this i mean I don't get joy out of damning everyone or something, but I'm trying to save my own soul, you see. So I've got to find out, you know, what's going to cause me to be damned? Well, following this falling away from the faith, these lying signs and wonders, not loving the truth, being a part of this movement that is a part of the preparation, the introduction of Antichrist to the world. As I've said before, all over the world, people today know about the charismatic movement. Back in the 50s, it was in a corner. In the 60s, it was coming out. In the 70s and 80s, everyone knows about that now. The great charismatic conferences where the major networks would send reporters to cover things like that right. and put it on TV. A lot of people don't know if you just stop someone on the street and want to talk about a charismatic, they might have never heard of that word. But you mentioned the evangelist out in Tulsa. Everyone in this country knows him and probably around the world. Just say his name. Say divine healing. Say speaking in tongues. And most of them have heard of that. Amen. Most of them have. And so it's just preparation. You see, everything is going to have some type of preparation that goes beforehand. Yep. Otherwise, as I say, Antichrist would just pop on the scene and they'd say, Antichrist, who's that? Miracles, what's that? End times, what's that? But everyone's being prepared through the charismatic movement for all of this that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, I think I'll end here on a few positive verses. We'll read some of the rest of the chapter. Well, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. <laughs> Gets out of the darkness of those first 12 verses there. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. So, you see, he's just left the world and it's sin, and he's chosen out the elect ones. And that's why we understand what we do. 
God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you know, all you people look at me and think of me as a religious man, a spiritual man, but there was one time I wasn't. I was just a lost person like everyone else is. It's hard to conceive of someone once they're saved when you didn't know them when they were lost as just a wicked lost person. <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you a little story. I got thinking about one of my past friends from a long time ago, and I found out their number, where they live, and others. I picked up the phone yesterday, the day before, and called them. And... I didn't want to tell them anything about me. They knew a little bit of what I was into now, but I didn't want, I just wanted to talk, let them talk and hear what they're doing. And I just, we talked about a half an hour and I said, well, you know, and I, I let a little praise the Lord would slip out every now and then. You just can't help it because you're used to talking like that. And I said, well, he said, what'd you call for? And I said, well, I said, to tell you the truth, I really don't know, except I just wanted to listen to you talk. I hadn't talked to this person for years. They were just shocked. Their wife answered the phone and said, I can't believe who this is. <laughs> but I just wanted, I just got curious and just to listen. And the person has no conception of spiritual truths at all. No conception of spiritual values at all. And we at one time were in that boat together. I was just like he was. We didn't understand anything. We were two lost boys together. And I didn't do anything to get where I am now. Why did he pick me and not him? Just, that's why I wanted to listen, just to rejoice in my own salvation some more. He was shocked, and I was, I was really blessed to talk with him and talk with his wife. I knew her back then, too, but I knew him a lot better because that goes back, I don't know, 10 years or so ago. And it's, it's not often I do something like that because past friends are no friends as far as I'm concerned. And then it makes you start thinking. I was telling my wife some about all the precious people here. Well, you know, out there in the world, you just don't have any true fellowship. Amen. Where in this Amen. church, you know, we take it for granted that if something breaks down at your house, just call the brother up. He'll run over there and fix it for you. You know what I mean? And out there in the world, you don't have friends like that. Right. Who, when last minute you want to do something, you can dump all of your children over someone else's home. I don't recommend that, but you could do it <laughs> last minute. And they'd say, Sister, praise the Lord. I'll love watching them for you today. And, you know, you'd have to bicker and dicker on the price with someone else if you were out there in the world. <laughs> Don't take these things for granted. I've been thinking Amen. about the precious fellowship we have here. You can't Amen. even talk like this to people right. out there. Amen. They think we are effeminate loony birds the way we act because we all love one another, you know. <laughs> and that is strange. <laughs> But out there in the world, you know, you're all on your own. If the ship sinks, you're just all on your own, except maybe you got some relatives that'll help you. And they'll charge you interest, though, if you borrow money from them. <laughs> they really will. And here in this church, you just say, you need that? You can have it, brother. Praise the Lord. But you see, we've got faith because we know God will supply for us. But in the world, you're stingy. You're stingy. You're always trying to grab your own things. So this was really a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I didn't do that now preparing for this message. I did it because of some things I've been working on myself at home. But this verse 13 and 14 really come out that I was chosen from the beginning for salvation. And my former friend, who is no friend, I have no friend unless he's a friend of God. My former friend, who is no friend, not any longer, was not chosen from the beginning. I assume that he's not. Maybe he'll get saved later on or something. I don't know. But from what I know, I assume that he wasn't chosen from the beginning. Wow. What a work that he does in us. Amen. Makes us religious people when we didn't used to be religious at one time. So verse 15, therefore, and I think of some of you, I think of one sister here that my wife tells me the story occasionally. She used to kick the tape player. She got so mad at my sermons that I preached. I don't mean to embarrass her, but <laughs> she just used to hate that fellow preaching those sermons. She would just kick the tape player. I doubt she does that anymore. He has a way of changing you, you know. You can't get too close to that slippery creek bank or you'll go over in. And she did. She wandered a little too close and got the baptism and got the whole message. Praise the Lord. 
Yeah, she told me one time, this has been years ago, she knows who she is, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but she used to, she said, I couldn't understand my husband, he would drive from our home all the way over to your church and pass up so many churches on the way to yours. Yeah. You know, logically, that doesn't make any sense. You take the nearest one down at 4th and Broad, you just go there. <laughs> Why drive all? <laughs> why drive all through the country, passing up twenty, thirty churches? And she said there were many between where we lived and where you were to come to your place. And she said that after she was passing all those up too. <laughs> well, I used to do that. We used to drive by I don't know how many churches to get to our church. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we drove a long way to get to the church out here where we are right now. How many did we pass on the way out here? Oh, they must be innumerable. Oh, dead, dry churches that we've passed. And we weren't looking for any of them. We were looking for a heavenly church and not an earthly one. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by word or by our epistle. And now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Well, that's as good a place as any to stop then. Praise the Lord. I think that went long enough for our two messages tonight, so we'll stop there. Praise the Lord. This business about election really is precious to me. And it should be to everyone who's elected. It's only fearful to those who don't think they're elected. Because there's nothing you can do about it. But I know that I am. And I've told you before, even if I'm not, I'm going to pretend like I am anyway. Praise God. Amen. People say, you're deceiving yourself. I say, well, don't wake me up from the good dream. Man. Amen. And if, if I die and there ends up being no life after death, well, all I would have missed would be a few carnal sins. But I'm going to take that chance, though, because if there is a God, I'm in lots of trouble <laughs> if I don't go his way. So you can call it a chance, but see, I, you're more risky than I am if you're taking it the other way. People say there's no life after death. Well, I don't know. We'll find out after we die, won't we? Amen. Whether there's life after that. Amen. And I'm just going to take the chance that there is life after that, that there's a heaven and a hell after that. And so I'm going to miss a few carnal sins now to gain eternal life. And if I'm wrong, that's all right. I'll be dead forever gone. <laughs> I won't go to hell, that's for sure, because it won't exist. <laughs> so they can call us effeminate little people because we love and we don't do the macho things in the world. That's okay with me. Because we're going to live a life that's pleasing to God because we believe that he exists. All oh, prove it. Well, we can't prove it. We believe by faith. That he exists, that he made the world, that he made you and I, that he made a heaven and a hell. And then he's got our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's where we're going. That's where we're headed, to the afterlife. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah.